someone approached me after a talk I gave and said, what you're doing in software is very cool. You should know it would work even better at roofing. Uh, candidly, Tim, I laughed at that person because I didn't know anything about roofing at the time. One of the first things, in, in specific to storm and restoration roofers, you should never, ever, under any circumstances, have your rep sitting on hold for two hours of State Farm to schedule an adjuster appointment. And what I would tell anyone that is evaluating being a part of a roll-up or getting acquired by private equity, your organizational DNA is the most critical component of success. Hey, how's it going? It's Tim Brown, and this is the Hook Better Leads podcast, and I have Adam Patterson from SMA Support Services. How you doing, sir? I'm doing well, Tim. How are you? Very good. Thank you for coming into the office, by the way. I appreciate that. You've got a hell of a space here. By Thank the way. you. So. I feel like in-office podcasts are just always so much better because you can like be right there with the person and feel the... 100%. And I also, I want your viewers to know, I saw the most impressive single-use shared bathroom I've ever seen in my entire life. Oh, no. No, no. Incredibly impressive. Traditionally, these are abject nightmares, yeah. disasters, right? This thing was meticulously clean. You, oh, should, you yeah. should be proud. Okay, good. Well, it's not for things because I have been blowing it up in there. So <laughs> it's not for lack of trying from my end. Um, no, but we're talking about how, why you should stop making salespeople do things besides sales. Yeah. And I think that this is pertinent because salespeople, <laughs> salespeople are frustrated with it. Mm -hmm. But I also think business owners could experience more sales and higher numbers per salesperson if they just figure out this, the support things that they could do for the people. So um, what makes you uniquely qualified to talk about these things? What's your background in business and yeah. what have you um, experienced that could help you speak to this? Yeah, yeah, certainly. So uh, the last Five or six years I've been working, I've owned a consulting practice uh, outside of Austin with a few business partners. We've worked with private equity and venture capital funds on high growth, high velocity businesses. So said differently, that is a business where the fund has made a series A or a series B investment. The fund wants top line revenue to grow three to 500% in three year period. They want to do it by the way, so that they can have a successful exit at the turn, rinse their hands, repeat, uh, continue on their way. Uh, I love, love doing it because I've found the work to be exciting, uh, exhilarating, and really driving. Um, I'll tell you, I got into roofing a few years ago because presenting at a conference, someone approached me after a talk I gave and said, what you're doing in software is very cool. You should know it would work even better at roofing. Uh, candidly, Tim, I laughed at that person because I didn't know anything about roofing at the time, but I piqued my interest enough to begin to learn, do some primary market research, and I found that to be really true. And, and here's the reality, right? I've been involved in a handful of software unicorn startups and I can help even build billion dollar exits. When I look at the most successful software companies and the most successful businesses that have had billion dollar exits, they have three things that are in common that are true for every single roofing company. Uh, the first is they had a sales team and a sales force where all you had to do was try and put forth effort and you could make six figures. And that is very true in the roofing space, right? If you come and you work hard, you can earn six figures. That's possible, it should be possible. If it's not, you've got probably something wrong in your comp plan. Uh, the second was they had a culture that made it easy to believe in something bigger than their selves, themselves, right? So everybody could buy into a vision of something bigger, greater than them and them alone, uh, which is very true in roofing in the way that, you know, our roofers support their local communities, integrate into their local communities. Uh, and the third was that they were high velocity, meaning that they had a lot of work happening all the time, mm. right? Which is incredibly true of roofing. So the more I began to learn about this space, I learned, geez, like the three most important critical things in organizational DNA for successful exits exist in almost every single roofing company <laughs> in the world. And with a little bit of operating hygiene, go to market strategy, revenue strategy, right? There's no reason that any roofer can't hit that great exit. So I think some of the things we're going to talk about today are going to help your company in the field of having a higher valuation. But I also want to pick your brain a little bit at the end about the state of private equity and roofing right now, where sure. you think we are on the cycle. <clears throat> yeah. And I'm sure you have some perspective on that. So that will be a little special segment at the end of this podcast, our private equity corner, as sure. I like to call yeah. it. And it's new. Also, we're hopped up on C4, by the way, if you can't tell. We're very caffeinated. Uh, this is a pre-workout drink. Whatever it takes to get through the course of the day. And we're not going to be working out. No. Yeah. I already worked out this morning, so. Intellectual stimulation only. So uh, you had a moment ago talked about what makes me uniquely qualified to talk about kind of sales reps doing anything other than sales. I would yeah. tell you that 
when you look at high performing organizations and businesses, there's something that's always universally true, which yeah. is their revenue generating roles spend 80 to 90% of their time generating revenue. Mm. Right? That is the focus of their job, what they do best. And that's the work, by the way, that they seek out. So when they're prioritizing their own schedule on their own day, they're going to prioritize, how do I go make more money and how do I make more sales? Mm -hmm. I want to get those endorphins. I want that oxytocin. I want to feel good. I want to like what I'm doing. So subconsciously, my brain is priming me to seek those opportunities to feel that you know, positive, good neurotropic energy out, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to seek that workout, which means also that I'm probably not going to prioritize all the other things <laughs> that you're throwing yeah. to me as part of a salesperson or an account mm -hmm. manager or a home advisor that get in the way of me driving that outcome and having that feeling. Which could then lead to obviously customer service issues. It could lead to customer negative, incredibly negative customer experience issues. It can lead to... Which would in turn decrease the quality of the person's energy who you want to have, the people in your business that you want to have their personal energy be very good. Incredibly good. Because yeah. their, their personal energy is what will bring you in another couple hundred thousand dollars of they are that week. Yeah, a hundred percent. And in the other piece of that, right, is that in roofing, nobody's actually in the roofing business. I want to be clear about that. You're in the reputation and relationship business, like those two things. So whatever you have to do to protect that reputation and strengthen that relationship between your organization and your homeowner should be a top line priority for you. All right. So we kind of talked through the problem. You know what the problem is. Uh, my first question is, well, it's going to be my main question throughout the whole sure. podcast, which is what is something that you could, t that roofing companies could take off their salespeople's plates yeah. that would help them sell more and have a better customer experience? Yeah. One of the first thing in, in specific to storm and restoration roofers, you should never, ever under any circumstances have your rep sitting on hold for two hours to State Farm to schedule an adjuster appointment. Like mm -hmm. that, is a, that is a 15 to 25,000 hour phone call. Right, because that's the difference between two more claims, one more job, one more contract. Mm. Right? Is it worth lighting twenty grand on fire in your parking lot so that your rep can book an sometimes adjuster appointment? It, sometimes it's <laughs> the roofing business owner doing that, right? One hundred percent. So these are two people that could be doing that. Something significantly more value added to the organization. Mm -hmm. Right? It's about priming that rep to be. How do I make most of your day focused on value add activities mm -hmm. for us as a company, for you as an individual, and for our homeowners long term? Uh, doing things like scheduling adjuster appointments, even with the nuance and intricacy, hey, we don't want to meet with this third party adjuster, they're blacklisted, we can't accept this appointment. There are ways to build in process around that and to mm -hmm. deleverage your staff from things like that. And that includes, by the way, things like more downstream, insurance workflow flights, insurance paperwork flights, well, right? All right, let's, before we get into that, like, talk to me about that though, because I think some roofing salespeople and business owners feel like that's their job, mm -hmm. you know, like it's, it's a, I've heard it said this way, that there's like an addiction mm -hmm. to the, um, it's, it's really adrenaline, like the scientific word, I think it's like epinephrine or something like that. Sure. Your brain almost likes the fight. Yeah. You know, and I think that in roofing, there's like, there is this addiction to the fight. Yeah. That's why we're all so competitive with each other. That's why roofing company owners like will like rip out each other's signs. Some, or roofing company owner like or roofing company people. I mean, will sometimes do things that may look like that they're actually against their best interest mm -hmm. because they're addicted to the fight a little bit. Yeah. So like, how how do we deal with that? How do we deal with? And I'll be real. Like I'm a little bit competitive too. Competition yeah. is fun. And sometimes it kind of goes hand in hand with this insurance, this fight against insurance. Sure. So how do you, how do you let go of that? Yeah. So I would, I would liken it to this, right? Yeah. When you think about the track, let's say you're a great 400 meter sprinter, right? You're an Olympic 400 meter sprinter. Uh, I want to get you from the locker room to the track to run that sprint as fast as possible. And I want you sprinting as much as I can. What I don't want to do is have you walk two and a half miles from your home to the track to then go through the sprint. And when I look at a lot of the process that goes around you know, architecting those fights, those arguments, you gotta work backwards from goals and outcomes. Mm -hmm. Your goal and your outcome is, how do I drive the best outcome for my homeowner possible, right? And then in order to get that press and primary outcome, what's the work that goes behind that? Which of that work and what of that work requires me and can I do? And what of that work can kind of anybody do that can clear me up to focus on more of that value add specific, only I can do this part. 
right? So I don't think it's as much don't have a fight as I do think it is how do I set myself up to have really effective fights in the most cost-effective manner with all the information I need to be successful for myself, for my business, and ultimately for my homeowner as well. As long as we get to fight. Yes. Join the future of roofing at offers.roofle.com. Stand out, save time, earn more. All right, so I agree 100%. I think that that is a definite waste of some people's time. I, I don't even, I don't get on the phone and spend two hours. Like, I'm going to have somebody on my team do that. I have somebody else doing that. So there's <laughs> yeah. going to be two hours on the phone. Sure, if you're lucky, by the way. Yeah. Right? So. Yeah, and then what are we, ta what are we talking about? What else is something that <clears throat> roofing salespeople should not be spending on yep. time with? And, and I need you to justify this, too, because I think a roofing business owner might be thinking to himself right now, I don't know. Isn't that what I pay them for? Yeah, sure. If you're paying them to do nonsensical work that anyone else is, then you're in the wrong business. Yeah. Right? Well, some people do just pay like droves of low, low performing salespeople to yep. like try to make up for. Yep. And then there is an over indexing. There's a, that's a different symptom of a different challenge of business, right? Yeah. I'm going to throw as much, pardon my French term, shit at the wall to see what sticks. Yeah. And if I can get 10% of that ship to overperform the 90% that slides down the wall, it doesn't really matter. It creates mm -hmm. institutional risk because the minute that one of that 10% decides, fuck this, I don't want to work for a company where in my 45 hour work week, 30 of those hours are spent doing, you know, managing subs, fighting with insurance companies, sitting on hold with insurance mm -hmm. companies to get adjuster appointments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I could go make more money and drive more outcomes and have a better life and work experience if I take my talents elsewhere, mm -hmm. right? So like, you know, you are paying at the end of the day, you're paying your salespeople to generate revenue. That's, that's like number one, number two, and number three focus of what their job should be. You know, mm -hmm. and again, reputation in, in, in relationship business provide an incredible customer and consumer experience for the homeowner. Mm -hmm. like, that's what they should be doing. Uh, that's the work that only they can do. That's kind of why they took the job, right? And I bet you if that roofing company owner is being really honest with themselves, they probably didn't tell the rep as they were interviewing them, yeah, I expect to uh, spend seven and a half hours a week on hold with State Farm to schedule three or four different adjuster appointments that uh, you know, you'll show up for and be really value add at, but there's a lot of administrative work that goes into that process in order yeah. to get there. How do you feel about doing that, right? Yeah. So um, I would tell you that like the insurance piece for storm restoration roofers is a huge part. It bleeds into what I call 1A, what I would call 1B would be collections in AR. Mm -hmm. So. On average, the industry average is 64 days. So from final invoice to check pickup is 64 days. That's two months. The, really? The amount of institutional risk that that creates, right? Anything could happen over the course of two months. Mm -hmm. And that can happen because reps know that they promised something <laughs> through the course of that sales process that isn't reflected in the final invoice or a final check amount, and they want to avoid a difficult conversation. That could be because they know that the sub didn't do great work and left shingles and bushes and left nails in the driveway, et cetera, et cetera, and they don't want to go get yelled at by the homeowner. Could be because they don't really care, they don't need that money right now, and I'll just get it when I need it. It doesn't matter to me. The business is going to be fine. It'll be there, whatever, mm -hmm. right? What it creates is room for that homeowner to have their oil furnace die uh, and have a $22,000 insurance check sitting on their table for two months and mm -hmm. say, oh, you know what? I should get a new furnace right now. They're never coming by anyways, right? Yeah. What does it matter? So, you know, cash in for jobs completed are important. Uh, that becomes even more convoluted when you begin to think about things like insurance depreciation checks, matching insurance releases to final invoice amounts, when it comes to like mortgage checks and endorsements and ensuring mm -hmm. that the home, knowing that the homeowner is going to get that, you know, asking a rep to chase those things and prioritize that is a big aspect of their work. Uh, they're probably not going to do it. <laughs> if they do it, they won't do it terribly well. Uh, and you're in the same position where it's like, you know, am I going to seek out and look for the work that I love and the work that makes me happy? Uh, or am I going to seek out and look for... Loose ends. It feels right. like loose ends. It's big time loose ends. Yeah. And a lot of roofing sales has been loose ends. Sure. Like, it's a lot of loose ends. Like, you get 20 homeowners in the, in the door and, like, deal with the loose ends. And then a lot of people burn out. Like, you think about the end of the year stuff. Like, yeah. in Minnesota, we've got, like, kind of off-season, right? Like, mm -hmm. Think about like October, November leading up to off season from what I've seen is roofing salespeople 
are doing the loose ends and really not selling anything new, even though there's leads, like you know, nope. there's yeah. leads coming in and there's stuff to sell because they're satisfied with, with what, what their money is. Yep, and they are licking their wounds and waiting for next season and I'll deal with that another day, right? And if they're it, burnt they're, out. They're big time burnt out. <laughs> burnt right? out. And, and I mean, like, what is burnout? You know, like, does it matter? Burnout matters a lot. I'm gonna tell you, there's this famous phrase, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. I'm sure you've heard this. Yeah. It's bullshit. <laughs> it is complete bullshit. Work is always going to be work, yeah. right? It will always be work. And there will be times where we love it and there will be times when it's draining. The reality is, if my work fuels my unique genius, drives my soul, fuels my spirit, I will seek that work out even when I'm burned out, even when I'm tired, even when I'm drained, because I know that it fuels me and that I get something from it, right? Mm -hmm. So even though I might be a little burned out, even though my eyes are bleeding and my hands are numb, I'm gonna still continue to pursue that work because I love the work itself. Mm -hmm. I don't, as a roofing salesperson, I don't love loose ends. It's just another thing that I kind of have to do at the end of a long fucking season where I'm a little bit chapped and a little bit burnt. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not gonna go out of my way to seek that workout. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, AR in collections, again, is a, it's a big part. That's bottom line revenue. Like, that's what keeps the lights on, keeps my distributor happy, keeps my invoices paid, right? Make sure mm -hmm. that I don't have to, so to speak, rob Peter to pay Paul in order to yeah. keep my operation going. Um, it is, uh, it's really, really important. And it's something you, that, go ahead. Sorry, can you talk to me about that robbing Peter to pay Paul thing? Because there's a, excuse me for interrupting, by the way. I have to, no, please. I have to snap myself when I do it. And I'm going to do it even on the podcast. And everyone's going to come up to me and snap me when I do it at, yeah. a, at a trade show or something. But it's something that's been coming up a lot in just roofing content creators, people on Facebook and stuff like that, talking about this robbing pay, uh, Peter to pay Paul thing. And I was kind of getting the sense that like a lot of roofers might be wondering if they're doing that. So what does that really mean? Where, where is it really a problem? Yeah. If you're like, where's the problematic yeah. so piece? The problem is, is where you're, using aspects of revenue to um, shore up shortcomings in other areas in treating what I would call symptoms of disease but not curing disease itself, mm -hmm. right? Like, hey, uh, I've had a persistent nosebleed for three months. Uh, I'm not gonna just continue to buy gauze. I might go to the doctor and check out why my nose is bleeding. I could just go to CVS and mm. continue to shove gauze up my nose, right? And yeah. I'll get somewhere, but I don't know what is really wrong in my business and I've done nothing to mm. cure that disease moving forward. And so. There's this like old adage in roofing, sell another roof, right? Yeah. Just sell another roof, sales cures all. Mm. Nope, <laughs> it sure doesn't. Particularly if my production schedule uh, can't get in line with the homeowner expectations that I set, uh, particularly if I can't get releases from my distributor because we're two months behind on invoices and I don't have revenue in the bank because my AR 90 day past due is a significant portion of what my revenue is. It means that like I've, you know, instead of running 30 or 40% GP, I'm having to final settle on outstanding balances at you know 10 to 15 percent GP, which ultimately doesn't work mm -hmm. when I have to be insured, bonded, W2 my employees, pay mm -hmm. my staff, right? Then there's nothing left. The gross profit and net profit are not one and the same. So I, I feel like at, it's kind of, I feel like it's kind of uh, the same. The problem it happens in lower income uh, companies. Like if you're talking to like five to ten million, sometimes. Or even lower, mm -hmm. but it is—it's interesting when you see a company that went to a hundred million and then is experiencing this, but they didn't like address it earlier, and then is like catastrophically failing. We've we've seen a in a couple just places. recently, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna name anybody, but yeah. you know, like that hurts. Yeah. So it's like it's maybe you won't go to hundred because that we'd all be blessed to go to catastrophically fail at a hundred. Well, no one would actually want to do that, but. We'd only be so lucky to get there in sure. some way or fashion. But like we're talking about even getting to 10 million and if you hadn't addressed these things earlier, that two to three, four range, yeah. it could be um, very uncomfortable and mm -hmm. really be bad for you and the people. Because people do unethical things sure. that they didn't mean to do originally. I'll go get a deposit from this homeowner because I know that I can't order material for this job that I have pending next week. And so mm -hmm. I'll just get this deposit and I'll have to worry about how I make the ends meet and the yeah. other things later. Right, like eventually that bill comes due. It's gonna catch up with you. Okay, so that's a very good specific example of a way that you could be robbing Peter, Peter to pay. 100%, yeah. yep. Okay. 
it could look I just like don't want that. everyone to think that they're doing it. No, I don't either. Because right? there's yeah. some businesses like it does like it does feel that way sometimes. For you know what I mean? Like I don't want all roofing company owners to think that that's what that. No, like, no, no, I, and absolutely not. There's there, always yeah. times where like cash flow is a little tight, and you sure. have to like be tight. And exactly, and that's where things that like if you overall if you've got a healthy financial balance sheet, um, your P and L is fairly healthy. You can do things like I need an injection of capital into this business to help grow. I might borrow against my outstanding receivable at you know eighty to eighty five percent of revenue recognition through mm. you know a low interest bank loan to ensure that I have capital on hand mm -hmm. to drive production in these jobs. Then I can pay off that low interest loan really quickly. But at least you're that's, loaning. You're not you're, sitting there like right. Yeah. You're right. There's a healthy, healthy approach. That's a healthy approach. Okay. Even things I like, like Square Dash and Link to some degree, right? Where I'm yeah. going to say. I'll give up, you know, a grand on this twenty thousand dollars that's outstanding yeah. because that capital today is more valuable to me than that, you know, revenue recognition asset long term. Mm -hmm. Where it becomes a challenge is saying that like, I don't know that I can make ends meet long term, but I boy would I like to have that nineteen thousand dollars today, even mm -hmm. though twenty and forty five days would be more valuable to me. Mm -hmm. So I gotta do whatever I have to do to get through this next two to four week period to survive mm -hmm. today to get to tomorrow. That's where you know. You've got a fiduciary responsibility to your homeowners mm -hmm. to ensure that you're a viable organization long term. And things that can negatively impact that viability, it's, it's a challenge. By the way, aside from, as we talked earlier about private equity and venture capital, you know, that you're going to get arbitrage in your valuation, right? So if your goal in this is, I want to be a part of a roll up, I want to get acquired by an outside investment investing company, uh, you know, you want to recognize and realize as much of your full value revenue as you possibly can. And anything less than that is going to be a reason they overcharge your value down at the negotiating table. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. And then we talked about, um, th I think, three things so far that salespeople shouldn't necessarily be wasting their time on. Sure. What's, what's one more? The big one, and this should speak right to your heart, Tim, uh, appointment setting. Lead, lead follow-up. Okay. So the greatest differentiator in success rate, and particularly in the top of marketing funnel, is speed to lead. Mm -hmm. So you want to get in touch with an inbound lead within 30 seconds or less. Uh, right now, the industry average is three and a half days. Okay. <laughs> so that means Which that, that's like literally like knife to the heart. Yes. Yeah. To think about like a lead that like maybe you paid money to get and then it's just waiting or sitting and no one's responding. Because literally... If, if I have a homeowner and somebody's taking me three days to get back to me, I'm already, I've called two other people. You've gotten the amount of time that, on average, and the amount of time that a roofing company owners either directly because they're taking on more than they should themselves and they don't trust their team to do it, or indirectly because they've thrown more work at their team than their team can handle and balance. The amount of time that it takes that lead to get a response, they've already scheduled an appointment with another contractor, more often than not, got at least a first proposal that they're gonna evaluate your proposal against, either signed a claim with the insurance company, done the inspection and filed that claim with the insurance with the other contractor as the provider. Right, so you know, as fast as you can be responsive to that appointment into that inbound lead, your success rate like quadruples, right? And anything after 15 minutes, you go from a 63% set rate on that lead to a 28% set rate on that lead, right? So. Well, okay. So, what are the different setups you've seen in roofing companies? Like, what are what are the average companies doing? Is it is it salespeople reaching out to them? <clears throat> How do they do that? Like, yeah. What are, what are the different outlays? That, that so, there's a, a few different approaches that yeah. I've seen. Mo what most companies are doing? Yes, the rep that goes directly to the rep, and the rep is supposed to follow up. And if they're lucky, they do it in the same day. Even if you're doing it at the end of the day, again, like you've got about a one third success rate mm -hmm. in terms of upsetting that appointment, following up with that homeowner. Like homeowners want attention when they express interest, not a minute before. So a lot of roofing companies don't even have that office person. They don't have that office person. It goes to yeah. the salesperson. They hope the salesperson follows up. What's genuinely happening, that salesperson says, I can just go Canvas and get another lead, or I've got a whole bunch of referrals that I can get, or I don't need this, I don't want to deal mm -hmm. with it, or these people are never qualified anyway, and I get out there and they're just car kickers, and I don't want to waste my yeah. time. Um, I see a lot of roofing companies that have an internal office person, either an internal sales team, inside sales mm -hmm. team that they house, or an office manager, an admin assistant, or a marketing contact that takes that lead, Follows up, right? Sets the appointment for the sales rep. Standardization is a problem there, right? Big like, time. I mean, yep. as the person who listens to calls, hi guys, sometimes listen to your calls. Yeah. Um, there's a, 
just some moments that I get confused by. Sure. One of them, <laughs> one example is just listening to a call and somebody's talking about immediate need leak from their roof. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because, you know, there's ups and downs in demand and somebody felt uncomfortable with the amount of work that they had on their plate and the mm -hmm. company had on their plate at the moment and said, I don't think that's us. Let me get you to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And I just think that if the business owner had heard that and seen that, they would be wildly disappointed. 100%. And yeah. I think that there's a little bit of standardization problem. Yeah. Like, or just like their workload was too high that they said, this is an immediate need and maybe there's just too, not enough reps and maybe we pounded them yeah. with leads one day or whatever. But t that's terrifying. It is. I don't feel like driving to Eden Prairie today. Yeah. Right? right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yes, that's exactly right. Um, and the other, like the third approach that I see, right, is, is uh, where myself, my organization comes is offshoring that. So mm -hmm. creating consistency, standardization, and approach, having somebody that's always there, ready and available to escalate. Mm -hmm. If we get, hey, I've got a week in a new project or an immediate week in a prospective new homeowner, I then contact this person who goes out immediately, talks mm -hmm. to the homeowner that makes sure that like A, our reputation and our relationship are strengthened and our market presence continues to improve, mm -hmm. uh, but also that we're not getting Jimmy in a bad day where he's got four other appointments set, he's split it on hold to State Farm for an hour and a half and he just doesn't have the time or energy to pursue this other thing. Because right. there's, there's a little bit of the, we, the lack of consistency in, in customer service. I think yeah. that sometimes we deal with, like there should be a very consistent process. Of course. Is there any ways that you've seen work for taking some of these things off from, um, Roofing company salespeople. Yeah, yeah. So I, as I mentioned before, a big part of the organization that I work with, SMA Support Services, does exactly that. We are business process outsourcing for roofing companies. So we, have, you know, know the industry. You're not teaching us roofing. You're not teaching us this industry. Um, we know the space and know it really well. A couple hundred years of experience combined uh, in roofing, and we try to take, you know, again working backwards from goals and outcomes to develop a consistent approach, delivery, and process to enable that outcome to happen. So you do all those things? We do all those things. So you guys do you know, insurance conversations yeah. for them? Some, how do you do AR collections? We do a lot of AR collections, and it's a lot of it is when I get back to that thought about you know, curing diseases and not treating symptoms, mm -hmm. a lot of it is proactive communication. Mm. So we are contacting the insurance company to verify invoice amounts and releases ahead of time proactively. We're contacting homeowners to let them know, hey, you're gonna have an insurance check that show up in the next two days from State Farm. This is the amount. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna have Tim come by on Thursday to pick that check up. Is there any reason that you can't sign that over to him in that day? Mm -hmm. if, if not, okay, what's going on? Can I contact Bob at production to get an understanding that we need to do another inspection? Or no problem, great. Mm -hmm. Tim, we should be there between 10 and 12. I'll make sure that he knows that you're gonna be available, right? So mm -hmm. contacting mortgage companies to understand, you know, hey, are you gonna endorse that check to the homeowner? When do you expect to have that check sent? So. A lot, a lot of different things. A lot of setting and lead follow up. So, lead follow up. That's nice. Lead follow up. Lead nurturing. Yeah. So and you guys answer phones and stuff. We answer. Phones. I knew this, but yeah. I'm just. You know, yes. Sure. I appreciate that. Being a mensch. Yeah. Being a mensch is helpful. Yeah. So when we look at AR and collections, you know, like in the industry average is 64 days for our contractor partners. From final invoice to check pickup is seven days. So. That's that's pretty cool. It's a week. Um, okay, before we get into the private equity talk, I just want to like ask, where are you guys at on the pricing comparison to like similar? Because I know you guys probably get compared to like VAs or and however you guys get compared. Where are you at on the pricing outlay? Yep. And yeah. Yeah. So there's a few things I would tell you to make SMA a little bit different yeah. than a traditional. So the first of those is industry knowledge and experience. We're dedicated to roofing. We focus in roofing. Uh, we could be a whole lot of different things to different people. I'm not interested in that. That's not exciting for me. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of need in this space and a lot of ways that we can help. Um, I'll, I'll tell you that you know, there's a lot of things that I could do with my life and with my time. And the reason I chose this is an opportunity to make an impact you know, both here and overseas. And when I say that, what I mean is I look at a lot of roofing company owners that started this business because they said, I want to take my family on vacation. I want to go to my kids' baseball games. I want to, right? I have all these things that I'd like to be able to do. And they get, you know, three or four years into building a five to seven million dollar roofing company and they realize like, 
man, I'm not going to baseball games anymore. I can afford to go on vacation, but I can't do it, right? Because I can't extricate myself from the business. Uh, I've got all these other new series and sets of problems that I didn't anticipate having, and I don't have a lot of resources around me to help me solve those things. Mm -hmm. Like, I want to help owners, you know, get back from this journey what they set out to accomplish in that mm -hmm. journey. And I think that, you know, business process outsourcing and virtual assistants is a great way to make that happen. And now this leads into the pricing piece. The other aspect is, you know, overseas, one of the things that makes us really different, we pay our staff two to three times what other agencies do. Uh, and part of the reason we do that is the discrepancy in the US dollar is marginal at best. The discrepancy in the Filipino peso is substantial. And so being able to make an impact overseas, as an example, we've got a, a young gentleman on our staff, 28 years old, um, who told the story that his mother had been involved in prostitution for his entire life. Uh, and based on the money that he was able to earn through working through SMA and partnering with one of our clients, was able to pull her out of that lifestyle for the mm. first time in you know, almost three decades, mm -hmm. right? And so that chance to make an impact on two sides of the world, to make significantly improve the life of our contractor partners, but also significantly improve the life of our team overseas, mm -hmm. it is a real, that's what fuels me, right? Mm -hmm. Work is always gonna be work, but if you find work that fuels your spirit, you'll seek that work out. Um, the way that we price is, so it makes us different, we're dedicated. So all the employees that work for, through SMA for our clients, they only work for our clients. So that it's the same exact thing as having a remote employee for your staff. Mm -hmm. um, it's just their work from home is in Manila, not in Rochester, Minnesota, yeah. right? <laughs> that's, the, that's the difference. Um, some, some urban company owners have a little bit of like, it's scary to have anybody work from home. You know what I mean? 100%. They haven't yeah. done that as much. Yeah. Even hybrids, some people haven't done that as much. And that's the beauty of having you know, a labor or you know, a contract with an outside labor agency. We have the ability to do a lot more monitoring, uh, and we'll call it big brother type work. Um, you know, we take, as an example, screen grabs of our employees' com uh, computer screens every three to four minutes so that we can see what they're working on. If their station goes dormant, we can screen grab to see why it's dormant and why it's not moving. Uh, the reality is our teams actually like this because we base our bonuses and promotions on getting caught doing good work. So mm. they always want to get caught doing good work, cool. and they're dedicated to doing yeah. good work. So dedicated, so I'm guessing that's going to put you on a little bit more expensive. You guys are paying a little bit yep. better. Yeah, we there. pay a little bit better. Um, we bring a lot of industry you know, wealth experience. We're client dedicated. There's really two tiers of pricing. Uh, there's what I would call your team lead. That's your person. That's your team manager, your primary point of contact between mm -hmm. your business and our, and our business. They're $20 an hour. Uh, our ask is just at least 37 hours a week guaranteed. Um, we can go over that and certainly can and do at times of like, hey, we just had a hail event in this area. We want to contact every homeowner that we ever worked with in the past to make sure that we can set appointments for our reps. Uh, and then we have your, your team, which is $17 mm -hmm. an hour. So everything is built in arrears. Um, we build twice a month. And what is arrears? So the work happens after two weeks. You get an invoice okay. with the timesheets so that you can see the hours that they spent when they clocked in and out, what that work output was. And we're, I mean, we're going to talk about private equity. So, but I just, where, what's the dot com just in case somebody is of course, trying yes. to go do this now? So check us out uh, a couple places, smasupport.us. The other thing I'd encourage folks to do, my career before this was in, again, building high performing teams and cultures uh, and as an executive coach and consultant. So check out our socials because we do a lot of give the game away for free. Uh, a lot of the feedback coaching guidance that I gave business owners and executives is a high price executive coaches there for the taking. I like it. Yeah. This is a subscription to knowledge, the most in-depth knowledge that you can find in our industry. We're spending the money to make sure that our production value is so high that you'll actually absorb the information and feel like you're getting something premium at the Building Experts Institute. Talk to me about um, where you think we're at in this PE game right now. Like what is, where are we at? Like, so I've been kind of following the HX stuff and like it feels like they're, they're kind of coming down in multiples and mm -hmm. it feels like roofing is kind of going up right now. Yeah. How far, I feel like we're at least a couple years into the game. What, how many years do you think we are into the game and what do you think, when do you think it's going to peak and when do you think it's going to go down? Do you think yeah. it's already peaked? No, we're about a year out from the peak would be my perspective on this. I think we're about two to three years in. There's a lot of macroeconomic conditions, by the way, that like this industry is going to be successful no matter what. We've got a housing shortage in the U.S. We've got you know 30 to 40 percent of homes in the U.S. that need a roof replacement in the course of the next 10 years. Like this industry is going to be successful no matter what. It's a high margin business with that's recession proof effectively, right? People are always going to need homes, so we're going to have to find a way to prioritize 
those at-home expenditures, particularly given those other things that are happening in the country, right? So the way uh, that, I appreciate that optimism. Yeah, the way that the way that the you know outside money looks at outside capital looks at this is a you know success you know in recession-proof success guaranteed industry in a lot of ways, right? And so they also look at it and say, just to get these huge rebates from manufacturers if I standardize my delivery and approach. Um, I can, you know, leverage bargaining power if I can roll up a bunch of companies and integrate that into one, you know, procurement methodology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I think we're early in the journey. Okay, so two, three years in, one I year away from peak. From peak. So you think of, do you think of it as like a, a 10-year kind of like it's up about and a 10 down? Year. Yep, I think it's, so we'll, we're, imagine this is where but we should. But then it gets sold off again, right? But Yeah, yeah you'll yeah. get the spin out. So I'll tell you, there's a, there's a fund that I worked with that, buys depreciated assets uh, based in California, outside LA. And about a year or so ago, when I told them I was doing a lot of work in the roofing space, they don't do any work in roofing today. And mm. again, they buy depressed, depreciated assets for a turnaround and mm. to, you know, again, get a successful exit. Uh, the gentleman who's managing director in that fund said, oh, that's really interesting. We've been talking about internally what our investment strategy looks like over the next four to eight years. And one of the things that we're thinking is, there's going to be a real opportunity to buy some of these roofing roll-ups at 20 to 30% of valuation because they're going to fail when they bring these businesses together. Ah, and so, that we can, so what that tells me is... That is no doubt going to happen. Yes, and it is happening, right? Yeah. And I would tell you a lot of the reason it's happening and what I would tell anyone that is evaluating being a part of a roll-up or getting acquired by private equity, your organizational DNA is the most critical component of success. So do I view my world, my approach to work, and my market opportunity in the same way consistently that everyone else in the fund does? Mm -hmm. And if you don't, it's guaranteed to fail. And I think you see that in some of the roll-ups that are happening now, in fist fights and quarterly business reviews and things that you hear about. But um, Did that actually happen? Uh, yes. And we can't name names. But <laughs> I am going to have to hear that after yeah. this podcast. Sure. Um, I am very interested. That sounds... <laughs> honestly, this is why I love roofing. <laughs> A fucking fist fight and a fucking yeah. Oh my god, that's so, incredible. So yeah, I'm sorry, I love it. No, it's great. Yeah. It's a good yeah. So uh, I would tell you this is what I would call kind of standardization. This is where valuation should be. I think we're right now we're here. I think we're yeah. going to peak in about a year to here. We're going to see a little bit of a market correction to come down to flat within the next five or six years. We'll dip a little bit below here. Uh, you know, you're getting a lot of early run on money. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, frankly, a lot of these funds made a shitload of capital. So they've got capital to burn and they yeah. can take a little bit more risk right now than, yeah. you know. And, and I think that's an interesting topic because I am still just coming to terms with there's essentially like, it's like having a warehouse full of pots and you have to move the pots even mm -hmm. if you discount it a little bit. And it's kind of like these guys have a warehouse full of money. Yeah, we're talking yeah. about like private equity has a trillion dollars. Then sure. they're going to what is it wielding? What are they twenty? They're usually spending twenty percent of their own money and eighty percent, or isn't it something Less, like that? It depends. In private equity, it tends to be a little bit higher. In venture capital, is almost none of their own money. And so we're talking about like f then like four trillion dollars from banks, mm -hmm. and then there's four trillion dollars like or they, private outside investors, and then there's yeah investors. like family offices. It's like a trillion. So like, there's all this money sitting around, and I yeah. think that that's. I think that that's something that people have to kind of recognize. Like, basically what I'm saying is it's good. Yes, very it's good. It's good, like, because I think it's scary to think about money when you haven't had, uh, ever had a million dollars in your bank account and then somebody comes to you and ta is talking about $10 million. It kind of is scary. 100%. It's very scary. Because yeah. you're like, what are you talking about? Dude, yeah. there's, not a, there's not $10 million available but it's like no, there is. Sure. It's, and then I think that that's some of some of it is people need to go through that emotional journey of realizing like they have to spend this money to get their two percent. Private equity mm -hmm. people like they they not only on the exit they'll get their they'll get a good a get bigger chunk sides. of money, yep. but they're getting two percent just for spending that money. Yep, they get it on both ends. Which is very like I think just I'm not. I'm coming to terms with this now because I honestly was scared of it because I thought it was like, is that predatory? Are they trying to do something weird? No, they have to spend it. Yeah, they do. And, and it, some there is some predatory shit, but there there certainly is. And actually, that's one of the things I would tell anyone that is either thinking about private equity, talking about one of the things to look out for. If you talk to a fund or an outside investor or a broker that says, "Talk with me, ninety days or less, we'll get you an investment," I would run as far in the opposite direction as I could. You can't do an effective due diligence process in less than six months. 
hmm. right? That should be a you know five if you're lucky to nine if you're like the rest of us. What are some other things to look out for? I feel like you're a good guy to ask this. Yeah, thing. I would look out for that. I would look out for folks that want to rush me through that process as quickly as possible. Uh, I would you know think long and hard about your arbitrage. So the fund's job, they need to spend money. They're also, their job is to at get deals. peak valuation, get the best deal possible. If they want to run you through as quickly as possible, it's probably because they want to back you into a corner, break your negotiating leverage, and then hit you on things like you're understaffed. And in order to appropriately staff your organization, we have a $250,000 of additional expenses. So I'm going to ding your valuation down at least 500 grand. There's no way that I could possibly spend that amount of money. Or, hey, you're paying your people way too little. It worked really well for you as a private owner. However, I'm going to have to normalize their pay structure. So I can't invest in your business in this way. Uh, the other things I tell folks to look out for, how diversified is your, you know, your revenue stream? If you're an owner operator and you are, hey, 40% of the sales are me and I've got a team that cleans up all the other things, get out of it. You gotta get yourself out of selling. If you wanna sell particularly, they're not buying Tim Brown, the person, they're buying your Tim Brown roofing, right? So you've gotta have a Don't team. Don't tell me. <laughs> I'm feeling the urge. You, you've got to have a team that drive out that drives yeah. outcomes. In in order to build, that just gets to you know something more critical. If you want to build a great business, your job in building a great business is building a business that can thrive without you there. Mm -hmm. You are not a part of it at all. Yeah, right? and and that's something that I think gets lost a lot on folks. They think like mm -hmm. I've got to be super involved. I've got to be really involved. There's a little bit it's of ego easy, there too. Right? Like even. If the business was running smoothly, it's kind of nice to come in there and just like, oh, you need me though, remember? Yeah, yeah. Remember old brilliant, <laughs> old yeah. brilliant Timmy's got some ideas here. There's, there's a lot of long hikes in the desert and acid trips that can kill an ego for you yeah. if you need. But. <laughs> oh, I do need, yeah, I would love to kill that ego. Um, anything else to look out for? I think this is a great little use of private equity yeah. corner. And I talked, you know, as well about one of the big things I tell you is like why I see why I see integrations between two, and I would see this all the time in software, when I would see you know, one software company buy another software company, and then they would fail integrating the two businesses together. It's because the DNA didn't match. So like, you gotta be really clear. You have to be able to articulate who you are as a company, what vision you cast for the world, what your mission is, how you approach delivering that mission every day, how you approach your world, how you evaluate your market, what and your like, I, strategy. I, I always use this example, but I, there's a roofing company um, in Atlanta, the Perimeter. Mm -hmm. Ray Little and, and uh, Todd Price, they're, they've, they're, on, they're only acquiring people on Aculinx mm -hmm. and with the same pay structure and with the same distributor. So they got three things lined up. Sure. They're trying to like, yeah. and like they spent time. I think I'm not saying anything that they wouldn't care, like if I said, but it's like they spent time actually mentoring people mm -hmm. beforehand to try to line it up. That's exactly right. And that's what I would look for in a partner. Yeah. All right, can you mentor me and coach me? How open are you going to be? Can yeah. I talk to anyone and everyone you've had gone through due diligence process with that's now a part of that roll up, mm. right? Um, that's good. How, how integrated within that operation can I be? What does my seat at the table look like? The big thing is, what's your plan for the turn? Because you're gonna get invested in private equity. You'll make a little bit of money in that first round of investment. You'll make a whole lot more money at you know five percent of a two hundred and fifty million dollar business than you will at forty five percent of a ten million dollar business, right? You're going to make a lot more money on the turn and the exit, and you got to know what the strategy good. behind that is. That's really good, uh, and that was so good. And I was still interrupting. What am I doing out here? I can't. What am I doing? Like it's it's so good, and yet I just I'm so excited to chat. I, I'm working on it. So. Do you, what do you think? Like, join a good platform that's got a great thesis or scratch, claw, and innovate your way to be the nucleus of a, of a roll-up? Yeah, depends. You know, I would say that that's going to vary a lot based on your market, some of the externalities, the things that are already happening in your market. Mm -hmm. If I were in Minneapolis, uh, I wouldn't scratch and claw to be a platform at this point. I would look and say, there's a whole lot of outside money that's coming in here and buying up a lot of these roofing contractors that are poised and primed to be successful and now have you know resources behind them that I don't have access to. So, so I better it, find a train to hop on. Instead, I'm gonna get run over by that train. If I were in a different market yeah. where a lot of that hasn't begun to happen, then I might be more open to being willing to be a platform mm. uh, of a roll-up. You have a little bit of an outside perspective on the roofing industry. Sure do. Um, 
do you think it's going to be a stuffier place in five years because of because all this money comes in and makes it a little like I love the like wild westness of roofing and I feel like it might lose a little bit of that now that private equity is going to hit yeah. hard. So I don't know that it'll lose the wild west aspect because I think that's part of what makes roofing really special. It's what I love too, by the way. Yeah. What I think it'll gain is sophistication that it sort of also desperately needs in life yeah. today, right? So, uh, and one of my favorite things about roofers in particular is these guys, you know, at least the handfuls that I've had an opportunity to been lucky enough to have met, they're looking for the help. These are not people that are gonna say like, I know how to do everything and you don't know. So one of the things that I hated working in the software world was uh, it was a series of narcissistic, egotistical assholes that thought that they knew better than everyone else in the world and that no one could tell them how to improve, effectuate, drive changes in their business. Uh, or were resistant to change in feedback when they just or just really needed it. I find the opposite in roofing. I find a lot of guys that said, you know, I thought I would do this for fun and maybe make a five and ten million dollar business. All of a sudden, I'm at thirty million top line, and I've got a whole series and set of issues that I'm not familiar with, and I need someone to help me kind of get through mm -hmm. to the other side of that, right? So I think what we'll see is a little bit of systemization uh, in this space to today that doesn't exist, and a little bit of sophistication, uh, so a little bit of a more sophisticated delivery approach in this space today that we we don't see today. And I mean, technically, I'm at fault for the speed at which Adam spoke because of the the caffeine that I fed him yeah. before this. It was a lot. You know what? I've all, it this was is 300 long, milligrams this of caffeine. Is, this has long been a challenge of mine. Yeah. I think, you know. No, because I normally listen to things like a, on audiobooks on like yeah. 1.7 sure. X. So like you were just hitting just perfect for me. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got to learn how to slow down. It's, yeah, and I need to stop interrupting. So yeah, we, we all, all are working on our things. And yeah. kind of knowing your weaknesses. That's just, a, we can go through a whole list of weaknesses if you're open to that. Yeah, no. I think just knowing your weaknesses will help you uh, particularly outsource the right things for your salespeople if you need them. So yeah. One more time, if you don't mind giving your guys is .com. Yeah, so we are at smasupport.us. And uh, as I mentioned, if we, even if we don't ever do business together, there's nothing that I can help you or your organization with. No harm, no foul. What I'd encourage you to do is check out a lot of the content that we have that's give the game away for free in our social media channels. Find us on you know, uh, Facebook, uh, on uh, LinkedIn, on uh, Instagram, uh, et cetera. So there's a ton of content that I think can be really helpful. Again, as you think about how do you build high-performing teams and culture, how do you change your approach and delivery to exactly a different founder or a leader within that business too. So. Absolutely. And thank you for watching. This podcast is put on by Hook Agency, hookagency.com, and Hook Agency all over social media. We're incredibly grateful to serve this industry. I really do love this industry. It's the best. And, I, and I'm grateful that you took the time to try to help roofing company owners. And um, guys, please like, comment, subscribe. Go check them out. Follow them. As I do think particularly... This private equity discussion at the end and these these kinds of conversations are going to add value to you as some of you are going to prepare the next year or two to to make the best decision possible and so we'd love it if you'd support people like this by going and checking out their shit thank you guys peace